Hey, Pastor Brennan here. I just want to say thank you for viewing this video sermon. I hope that you're blessed. If you're tied into a local church and you're viewing this as just sort of extra teaching, that's awesome. I hope you really enjoy it and that you grow spiritually. If you're not tied into a local church, I just want to encourage you to come and maybe visit Crosspoint in person or check out another Christ-centered, gospel-proclaiming church in your area because we believe that everyone should experience the blessing of being tied into a local church. But I hope this video is an encouragement and that it helps you grow in your affections for Jesus Christ. Many Christians today are traveling down the river of doubt. Its dark current pulls us into uncertainty where we have more questions than answers. Questions we're not supposed to ask in church. Can I still believe the creation story? Do I need a more progressive Christianity? Is God guilty of genocide? Can I still be a Christian if Christians ignore injustice. Many Christians are deconstructing their faith, and some are even deconverting. While we all have doubts, doubt is a part of faith. When the disciples saw the resurrected Jesus, Matthew 28 says, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Amid their doubts, they clung to Christ, and God used them to change the world. In fact, God designed our doubts to take us deeper into our faith. So let's journey down the river of doubt together. All right, if you're able, please stand for the reading of the word. We're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 12 to 22. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can find it on page 228 in the Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you. So 1 Samuel chapter 4, starting in verse 12, says this. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, what is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were so set that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the old man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her, hus her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed down and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured, and because her father-in-law and her husband. For she said, the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> On December 26, 2004, the largest recorded earthquake in history shook the ocean floor just west of the Indonesian island of Sumatra, sending 100-foot-high waves careening across the Indian Ocean at, watch this, 500 miles per hour. This tsunami absolutely devastated countries surrounding the Indian Ocean Rim, India, the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Seychelles, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, these countries were devastated by this tsunami. 230,000 people were swept into eternity. In the coming weeks afterwards, hundreds of thousands of people were displaced from their homes and the tsunami left $13 billion of damage in its wake the most destructive tsunami recorded in history. 
Now, while the tsunami damaged much of the eastern half of the world, over in the western half of the world, in our neck of the woods, it severely damaged, even destroyed, how many people view God. And this is 2004. So it's just three years after the terrorist attacks on 9-11. Many Americans were beginning to question, can God really be good when so many bad things are happening? And this tsunami for many became the tipping point in their worldview. They could no longer embrace the God of the Bible. If this God is so good and so powerful, then why is the world so bad, so evil, and why is there so much suffering? For example, Yehuda Bauer, a Jewish Holocaust professor, in the days after the tsunami, he wrote, there's no way there can be an all-powerful and just God Because if he's all-powerful, he's Satan for not stopping evil. If he's just, then he's too weak to make the world just. I don't need a God like that. Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the figurative head of 70 million Christians around the world. After the tsunami, he said, the Asian tsunami disaster should make all Christians question the existence of God. Ron Rosenbaum, a journalist for the New York Observer, he summarized his thoughts this way. He said, if God is God, he's not good. If God is good, he's not God. You can't have it both ways. If suffering on the other side of the world can lead us in the West to question the goodness of God, imagine what happens when suffering hits home in our own lives. When suffering isn't just over there, but suffering is happening in here, you better believe people are questioning the goodness of God. Whether the God of the Bible is real, is he trustworthy? Many people are asking these questions. But we have to remember that throughout history, across cultures, people have been asking the same question. We are not the first ones. If God is so good, if God is so loving, if God truly is sovereign and all-powerful, then why on earth would he allow so many bad things to happen among us? I mean, these are real questions that people are asking. And when we try to reconcile the good and sovereign God of the Bible With so much bad in the world around us, it's leading many people not only to question their faith, but to actually walk away from their faith. Because this anomaly between the goodness of God and the badness of the world, it raises philosophical questions or philosophical problems or objections to God. It also raises theological problems or objections to God. But perhaps most dangerously, it raises personal problems and objections to the God of the Bible. And many begin to doubt, and their doubts can descend into a spiritual deconstruction where their faith is now unrecognizable. And if they still believe in God, it's certainly not the God of the Bible. Many are actually walking away from Christianity altogether, embracing agnosticism or atheism. So I think it's really helpful for us living in the 21st century, that we can open the Bible and we can find a woman, a young Jewish mother, who lived 3,000 years ago, is asking the same exact question. She's grappling with faith in a good God who allows so many bad things to happen in her nation and in her life. We're not the first ones to ask this question. But this is a tough question. And it's important for us just to acknowledge that from the beginning. We can be humble as Christians and recognize there are Christians and non-Christians who are asking this question, and it is a legitimate question to ask. So let us not look down our noses at those asking this question, but humble ourselves and recognize this is an important question. It's okay to ask it, and we can look to the Bible for answers. Would you pray with me? Lord God of the universe, It is unequivocally clear that we live in a broken world where evil and suffering abound. And it is hard, it can be hard to reconcile your goodness with all the badness we see around us. 
So Lord, I ask by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would give us grace and you would give us wisdom to think hard on hard things and that we would be able to consider the philosophical problem, the theological problem. But I ask for extra grace as we grapple with the personal problem of pain and suffering in light of a good and sovereign God. But more than anything, Lord, I believe you need to show us your son, Jesus Christ, in a special way with crystal clarity that we can see amid all these philosophical questions and theological questions that our Lord Jesus Christ, he took this problem upon himself. He suffered. He dealt with evil and pain. Lord Jesus, in fact, all the badness of the world was brought upon you, the only truly good person. So as we grapple with this tough question, help us to see and savor the gospel in a new way this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, we are hitting the home stretch of our series, The River of Doubt. We have been uh, journeying down the river of doubt, right, and recognizing along the way that everyone struggles with doubt. And in fact, doubt is not the enemy of faith. Doubt is, in fact, a part of faith. So the goal behind this series is really for us to learn to doubt well. If doubt is inevitable in the life of a believer, we need to learn to doubt well. Now, how do we doubt well? Well, it starts by looking to the scriptures, not the culture, for the answers to our questions. We also want to make sure that we don't doubt in isolation. We can share our doubts with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Part of this series is for us to understand it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to express our doubts. So we want to make sure we're doubting within a spiritual community. And then finally, we want to make sure that as we're doubting, as we're struggling, we keep our eyes laser focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we do not doubt well, we're ripe for spiritual deconstruction. And it's this deconstruction phenomenon that's happening in our country over the past five years that has led many in the church to abandon their faith. So what exactly is spiritual deconstruction? It is an intentional dismantling of the Christian faith. It begins with the dismissal of the authority and the reliability of scripture. So those who are deconstructing their faith, they're not looking to the Bible for answers, they're looking to the culture, they're looking to online influencers for the answers to life, life's biggest questions. Not a good idea, just a heads up. And finally, deconstruction is picking and choosing which Christian doctrines we want to hold on to and which ones we're going to let go of or change according to our own cultural or personal preferences. That's what deconstruction is all about. And honestly, it is all around us. Maybe you weren't familiar with the term, but you can see it. You can see it in our culture. You can see it in churches in our nation. It is all around us. So in this series, each week, we're examining one specific catalyst, one common catalyst for deconstruction, and then we're opening up our Bibles to look for an answer from God's Word. Now, it was a natural disaster, right? The tsunami that made many in the West question the goodness of God. But in today's text, it is a national disaster in Israel that is causing this young Jewish mother to question the goodness of God. We're in the book of 1 Samuel today. It's written, shockingly, by Samuel, the prophet. And he is chronicling the story of Israel's transition from a period of judges, that's the book before, and now they're going to come under the kingship of Israel, first Saul and then King David. But what we see in the book of 1 Samuel, right at the beginning, is Israel's in a really bad shape spiritually. Israel is not doing well. They're continuing to wander away from God. And the spiritual leader of Israel, the priest Eli, he's asleep at the wheel. His two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they are serving alongside him, underneath him. They're ministering in the temple, excuse me, in the tabernacle. And when they get done doing their, their regular responsibilities, they're taking the liberty of sleeping with their mistresses in the tabernacle. That's where we are at this point in Israel's history. Things are really bad, and Eli is kind of asleep at the wheel. Now we go from bad to worse, because now the Philistine army is threatening Israel. In fact, they beat Israel in the first battle, and then the Israelites get this great idea. They say, huh, you know what we need? We need to bring the Ark of the Covenant 
onto the battlefield as a sort of good luck charm to ensure our victory. Now, those of you who are familiar with the Ark of the Covenant, you're cringing at the idea, right? The Ark of the Covenant, God told Moses to to create the Ark of the Covenant, and God promised that between those two angelic creatures on top of the Ark, the very presence, the very goodness of God would dwell with his people. Inside the Ark was the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses, but God said that his very presence would dwell in between the cherubim, the angels on top of the ark, the goodness of God dwelling among his people. And then the Israelites bring the ark out of the tabernacle onto the battlefield where they proceed to lose to the Philistines. And the Philistines capture the ark of God and bring it back to their temple. This is a national and spiritual tragedy in the life of Israel. Things really could not get any worse. And that brings us to today's text. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible with you, no problem. Do me a favor. Go ahead and reach underneath the seat in front of you. Grab one of these books. If you're not familiar, this is the Bible. It's not just a book. It's the inspired word of God. The creator of the universe has delivered his word to us in a book. And in a culture that subjectivizes and relativizes truth, this book is the heavyweight champion of truth. And we like to say around here, this book is spiritual dynamite. Because in this book, we find the one who can radically transform us. His name is Jesus. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 16. If you're using one of the Bibles under the seats, it's page 228. But it's important that we remember in this passage, a messenger from the field of battle who has witnessed their defeat runs back to Eli, the 98-year-old priest of Israel, and is going to inform him of the defeat. All right, here we go. 1 Samuel 4, verse 16. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died. So you'll notice the way Samuel's telling the story, it's not news of the defeat in the battle. It's not even news of the death of his scoundrel sons. But when Eli hears that the ark of God has been captured, the very presence, the goodness of God dwelling among his people, it has departed Eli departs as well. It was too much for him to bear. Continuing now in verse 19, look at the text. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, don't miss this, she's going to die shortly after a difficult delivery. And about the time of her death, the the women attending to her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God has been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. This is devastating. It's repeated multiple times. The ark of God was captured. God's presence among his people, the tangible sign of God's goodness has departed. This is hard stuff. You know, I've heard people say that the Bible is fiction, a fairy tale a great bedtime story, but it can't possibly speak into the complexities of our postmodern world. And you know what I've found? Those who say that have never really read the Bible. Because there is a rawness about the Word of God. There is an unmistakable, undeniable reality about God's Word that penetrates our postmodern existence. I mean, just think about this for a minute. As we read this story, 
we see that a young mom 3,000 years ago is asking the exact same question that we're asking today. It doesn't get any more real than that. This young mom is trying to reconcile a good and loving and sovereign God with a terrible, evil set of circumstances. This is devastating. This is no stranger to suffering. If there was ever a candidate to question God's goodness, it is this young mom. I mean, just think about what she's been through. Her husband has publicly shamed her by sleeping around in the tabernacle. Everyone would know about this. And then she's widowed. Her father-in-law passes away. Her nation is defeated on the battlefield. She delivers a painful birth and then dies afterwards. And to make everything worse, the Ark of the Covenant, God's goodness dwelling among his people has departed. It is overwhelming. It is unbearable. It is so bad that she names her son Ichabod in Hebrew. Ichabod in Hebrew means glory has departed. Now, I know we're in this day and age where everyone wants to have like a super unique name for their kid. I'm just throwing this out there to expecting parents. Not a great pick, okay? Not a great pick. Stay away from Ichabod. But understand what she's saying. She's saying the glory and goodness of God has departed from his people. What a devastating reality. What a terrible realization for this young Jewish mother. I mean, this is overwhelming. This is terrible. You know what? I wonder if 3,000 years later, if some of us here this morning can't relate to this young Jewish mother. You look at the circumstances in your life. You look at the evil of the world. Maybe you look at the specific suffering that you're enduring right now. And you're wondering, can God really be good when things are so bad? Maybe you too want to cry out, Ichabod. The glory and goodness of God has departed from me. This text and this difficult reconciliation between a good God who allows bad things to happen raises philosophical problems and questions, theological problems with God, as well as personal problems with God. So I want us to take these on one by one. Let's recognize the philosophical problem, the theological problem, and then let's try to grapple with the most difficult one, the personal problem of pain and suffering experiencing bad things in light of the good God who reigns and rules over the universe. So let's start with the philosophical problem regarding the God of the Bible. One philosopher, I think, summarizes the difficulty well when he writes this. If a good and powerful God exists, he would not allow pointless evil. But because there is so much unjustifiable, pointless evil in the world, the traditional good and powerful God could not exist. Okay, so are you hearing what that philosopher is saying? He's saying, hey, I look around and I see unjustifiable, pointless suffering everywhere, and there's no way a good and powerful God would allow unjustifiable, pointless, meaningless evil and suffering in the world. Therefore, I cannot subscribe to the God of the Bible. But Alvin Plantinga, a philosophy professor at the University of Notre Dame, he exposes... He exposes the hidden premise behind this claim. If we assume that evil never serves a purpose, and if we assume that our suffering is always pointless, then we are actually putting tremendous confidence in our own cognitive abilities to see and understand some of the most mysterious things in the universe. Do you follow that? Plantinga is pointing out, if you you are saying that suffering is meaningless, there's no possible justification, my suffering can never serve a purpose in the world, therefore God does not exist, he's saying, hey man, you're putting tremendous confidence in your own intellectual ability to see and grapple with some of the most mysterious things in the universe. 
And then he challenges those who believe that, and he says, what if, what if the purposes behind evil and suffering are not self-evident? In other words, what if they're really hard to see? And then he shares this illustration. He says, hey, if you go camping with your St. Bernard, everyone knows what a St. Bernard is, right? They're like 160 pounds. He says, if you go camping with your St. Bernard, and you're wondering if your St. Bernard is in your tent, it's pretty easy to figure out. You unzip, you look inside, and you see a 160-pound dog slobbering over your sleeping bag. It's like very easy to figure out. But he says, if you're trying to figure out if there are any no you know what a no is? It's an infinitesimally small insect that packs a huge bite. He says, if you're trying to figure out if there's any no in your tent and you can't see them, it doesn't mean they're not there. And he says, what if the reasons and purposes behind our suffering, what if they're more like no than they are St. Bernard's? What if they're not self-evident? What if we can't readily see them? It doesn't mean that they're not there. You see what Plantinga is doing? He's saying just because you can't see them doesn't mean that there can't be purposes, reasons, a point behind the suffering and the bad things that you're experiencing. Now, what's interesting is Plantinga, who's very well respected in, in the philosopher community, most philosophers have affirmed his observation. They say, in fact, it's bad philosophy to say, just because I can't see a reason for suffering, that there is no reason. Most philosophers would say, yeah, that's bad philosophy. But I want to take it a little bit deeper. And if I lost you on the noceums, I need you to come back. Plantica points out that if you have a God who is big enough to blame for all the bad things in the universe, then you simultaneously have a God who is big enough to have good reasons for allowing those bad things, even if you can't see them. I'm going to run that back one more time. This is pretty heady stuff. Plantica says, if you are going to blame the God of the universe for everything bad, if you believe that he is big enough and sovereign enough to blame for all the problems of the world, then you simultaneously have a God who is big enough to have good reasons for allowing those bad things to happen, even if you can't see them. But you can't have it both ways. You can't say, he's big enough, so he's on the hook for everything bad. But he's too small to have good reasons for letting it happen. That's philosophically inconsistent. You see that? That's important for us to recognize. Now, when we get past this initial philosophical problem, it's, it's interesting because there's actually something else that's there as well. Atheists, for a long time, have said the existence of evil and suffering, it actually undermines the case for the God of the Bible. But in fact, the existence of evil and suffering bolsters the case for the God of the Bible. At least according to one of the brightest minds of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, the famous author of the, the Chronicles of Narnia series, he was an atheist until he became a Christian. And he talks about how as an atheist, he believed that the existence of evil and suffering essentially disproved the existence of the God of the Bible. But the deeper he went into this, he realized that the existence of evil and suffering presented a bigger problem for an atheistic worldview. Lewis writes this, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. Translation, C.S. Lewis is saying, the very fact that as human beings, we can see an injustice and say, that's wrong. He said, that points to the reality of God. I mean, just think about it. If naturalistic evolution is true, if we have all descended from the bacteria that you find in your toilet, 
then why on earth, why on earth should we be able to determine what is right and what is wrong? You think genocide's wrong? According to whom? According to your little sensitivities? Who cares? Get over it. That's the logical consistency of naturalistic evolution. And Lewis is saying, wait a minute, the fact that deep down as human beings, we have a vehement response to injustice. We see something, we say, that is wrong, that is evil. Lewis says, that points to the reality of God. A transcendent moral lawgiver who has emblazoned on the human heart an idea of right and wrong. He's saying, listen, just a heads up, y'all. You atheists who think that, that disproves the existence of God, it actually bolsters, it actually bolsters the case for the God of the Bible. So philosophically speaking, the existence of evil and suffering does not disprove the God of the Bible in any way, but it does move us to the next problem, the theological problem. And I think we can frame the theological problem this way. If there is a sovereign, all-powerful God who reigns over the universe, then is he responsible for all the evil, for all the bad things in the world? Now, before the veteran Christians rush the platform and prepare a noose for me, I'm just going to ask you to just wait a minute, just wait a minute, and let's just pause. Let's think about this from the perspective of a not yet believer in Jesus or someone who does not fully subscribe to the Bible yet or even a new believer who's asking these questions. It's a fair question. It's a preeminently fair question to ask. In fact, anyone who's thinking critically must grapple with this question at some point. If God is sovereign, if he is in control over all things, does that mean he's to blame for the evil and the suffering in the world? It's a legitimate question. Do you guys remember the Hunger Games series? Remember that? Suzanne Collins wrote that uh, dystopian trilogy of this like, alternate kind of United States where things were incredibly bad. It's filled, right, with uh, oppression and evil and suffering and injustice. It was super popular in the 2000s. Well, my wife, Kathleen, she's a voracious reader, and she absolutely eviscerated these books. I mean, just plowed through them, and then all of a sudden I found myself on the couch with her watching the first movie. Now, if you're familiar with this series, you know just how evil and twisted this world is, right, in the Hunger Games. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute, we finish watching the first film, and I turn off the TV, and I'm like, that's Suzanne Collins, this one sick puppy. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how they let her walk around in society. I mean, this is a sociopath. you got to be kidding me. How could she author such atrocities? This is really demented. How could she conjure up those bloodthirsty baboons, those tracker jackers? I mean, this, this woman must be evil. And how ruthless of her to kill off that precious little girl, Rue. Oh. And how about the, the decadence of the capital compared to the degradations of the districts? I mean, how can Collins be okay with such economic injustice and inequality? I mean, what kind of barbaric monster is this woman? Every tragedy, every atrocity, all the suffering, all the senseless killings flow from her pen. Now I want you to imagine that my wife Kathleen looked at me and said, I know it's a really dark story, and I'm horrified too, but your anger is misplaced. It's misplaced. Don't blame Suzanne Collins. Blame the characters in the story. Blame the so-called peacekeepers who constantly are oppressing the districts. Blame the tributes for the senseless killings. No, no, blame President Snow. He's the one who presides over all this evil, this unspeakable evil and suffering. Listen, I know that Collins is the author, but it's the characters who are ultimately responsible for their actions. We can't blame Collins. It's way more complicated than that. She had a story to tell, and that story included evil and injustice and suffering, and it only magnified the kindness and the courage of Katniss and Peeta, if you've seen the film. 
No, no, we can't blame her for the evil and suffering. It was part of the story that she was telling. You picking up what I'm putting down? When it comes to the cosmic story of human history, there is a supernatural author. His name is God, and he has a redemptive story to tell, and that story includes sin and death and injustice and evil, and it only serves to magnify his love and his grace and his mercy and his goodness. God had a story to tell, and it includes our sin. But God is not responsible for our sin. We are. We are. While God is sovereign over all sin and all evil, he is no more responsible for that sin and evil than Suzanne Collins is for all the evil and injustice in the Hunger Games. This is so critical for us to understand. God is the sovereign storyteller. He has a redemptive story to tell and his goodness and his grace is magnified by the evil and suffering of the world. While we can't always see the why behind the evil and suffering of the world, we can see that it magnifies his grace, his love, his mercy, and his goodness in ways that a story that was void of evil and suffering never could. So important for us to understand that, brothers and sisters. So I believe we have addressed the philosophical problem. We just addressed the theological problem, but that leaves the personal problem. And in my experience, anyone who has philosophical problems with God and theological problems with God, they're actually covering up their personal problems with God. They have suffered. They have been afflicted. They have experienced injustice, and they are angry at God. And there's a philosophical debate to have. There's a theological debate to have. But ultimately, it is our personal problem with evil and suffering that is the biggest barrier to us embracing the God of the Bible. You know, it's interesting. When a tsunami tears through the Indian Ocean, we have the luxury here in the United States of America in our comfort and our peace and our protection. We can sit back and we can speculate about the character of God. We can pontificate about whether or not the Bible is true. But you know what's interesting? When a tsunami of suffering tears through our lives, it's no longer an intellectual exercise. It's no longer philosophical. It's no longer theological or theoretical. Oh, it's personal. It's personal. It's personal. And there are many people in this room who know how personal it is. When a doctor looks you dead in the eye and tells you you have cancer, it's personal. When you've been longing for a baby and the doctor tells you it's a stillbirth, it's personal. And when addiction is tearing apart your family, it's not philosophical. It's not theological. It's personal. God, how can you be good when things in my life are so bad? We struggle to embrace a God who would not only allow bad things to happen around the rim of the Indian Ocean, it's when that God will allow bad things to happen in our lives and the lives of those we love, that's when our personal problem with pain and suffering can get in the way and can prevent our relationship with the God of the universe. Is he really good? Does he really love me? Is he really for me and will never leave me or forsake me? Many today are wondering. When suffering comes knocking on our door, we too want to cry out, Ichabod. The glory and goodness of God has departed from me. This is what I need you to hear. The stakes couldn't be higher. If we can't press past this, if we can't plow through it, we can't be Christian. We can't be Christian 
Therefore, what do we do? What resources does Christianity have? What resources does the Bible have to help us push through the problem of pain and evil and suffering? How can we see that God is truly good when things are so bad? God has made John chapter 11 very precious to me over the last 10 years. In John chapter 11, Jesus is in Jerusalem and he gets word that Lazarus, a precious friend to him, someone he loves, he loves Lazarus, he loves his sisters, Martha and Mary, and they send word to Jesus that Lazarus is gravely ill and they say, Jesus, you must come now and heal him. And then John says something really strange, really peculiar. He writes, Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So he stayed where he was two more days. I remember the first time I really read that. And I said, that's a strange love. That's a strange love. Jesus made a conscious decision to not go and heal his friend. Jesus made a decision to let Lazarus die. Jesus made a choice to let something bad happen to people that he loved. That's a strange kind of love. It's a strange love. Two days later, Jesus does go to Bethany. And he meets Martha, and she's she's broken. She's crying. She falls at Jesus' feet, and she basically says, Jesus, where were you? If you had come, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, why did you let this happen? And Jesus looked her in the eyes and said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, though he die, he will live. And Martha, an incredible display of faith, she affirmed that Jesus was the Christ. She affirmed that in him was true life, was resurrection, that he was the Messiah that her heart had been longing for. And then her sister Mary comes to Jesus, and she falls down weeping at his feet, and she says the same exact thing. Jesus, where were you? How could you let this happen? Why did you let him die? You should have been here. And in verse 33, John writes this. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Now, the Greek word that's translated into our English Bible as deeply moved, the Greek word there is embromeomai. Embromeomai. And it's a vivid, vivid Greek word, and it literally means to be engaged in snorting. That's weird. Jesus was embromeomai. He was engaged in snorting. But in the graphic Greek, the visual there is an image of an angry bull stopping its hoofs, flaring its nostrils, and snorting in anger. Now, for some reason, that is way beyond me. The scholars who translated into English felt like we couldn't handle that type of vivid imagery. I don't know, but they translated it, he was deeply troubled. And they're robbing us of the emotion, of the imagery that Jesus is experiencing. John chose the word embromeomai for a reason. He's trying to tell us something. He's trying to get us to see something that we haven't seen in Jesus. Jesus is roaring with anger. Jesus, like a raging bull, is furious at what he sees. John wanted us to see that in that moment, pain and suffering and evil and sin and death became personal to the Lord Jesus Christ. He entered into it. He was furious with the brokenness of the world. There's some people here this morning who need to hear that Jesus is furious at what has happened to you in your life. He knows the injustice you've experienced. He knows your pain and your suffering, and he is embromeomai. He is snorting with rage at the brokenness of your life. 
And then John tells us, after he's snorting with rage, verse 35, Jesus wept. He wept. I can just picture him wrapping Mary in a hug, and he's weeping. He's sobbing. This is like snot kind of crying. It's like full emotions, everything coming out. Jesus wept. Watch this. Jesus knows everything. He knows he's about to raise him from the dead. Spoiler alert. And yet Jesus enters into their suffering. He's weeping. He's broken with them. And then verse 38, Jesus goes to the tomb. He looks into the tomb where Lazarus' body is. And once again, John says he's embromaomai. He's filled with rage at the very reality of death. And then Jesus does something incredible. He speaks into a tomb. He calls a corpse by name. Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man came walking out of the grave. How can Jesus do this? How can Jesus call a dead man out of his tomb? Because Jesus was getting ready to go into his tomb. Jesus was preparing for the cross. And on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who is truly good, took all the bad of the world upon his shoulders. Everything that's wrong in the universe was placed upon Jesus Christ on the cross so that one day when he comes back, he could make everything wrong right again. On the cross, Jesus took our problem of pain and suffering. He took it personally. He took it upon himself so that all those who look to him will not perish but have everlasting life. You know, in my experience, I find that we are really good at focusing on the evil in the world. We become fixated on the evil of the world, and in so doing, we forget about the evil that's right in here. We forget about the brokenness that's in here. We forget about the sins that we commit that not only hurt others, but break the heart of God. And Jesus Christ, the only one without sin, became sin for us on the cross, suffered the punishment that our sins deserved. He took all the pain, all the brokenness, all the suffering upon himself. So if we trust him, we're not only forgiven of our sin, we're wrapped in the bulletproof righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're adopted into the family of God by faith. We have a hope that no one can take away from us. But here's the reality. We still live in a broken world. We still see sin abounding around us, sin abounding in us at times, and it is hard. And we need to be reminded that Jesus, he roars with rage at the brokenness of the world. He's for us. He will never leave us or forsake us. That young Jewish mom, she cried out, Ichabod, the glory and goodness of God has departed. And then a thousand years later, Jesus came. Emmanuel, God with us, the goodness and presence of God dwelling among us as a man. And through that man, through the God man, we have salvation. This is the hope of the gospel, brothers and sisters. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. They're going to lead us in one more song, but I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. For those of you who are drowning and suffering right now, To those of you who are experiencing the pain of the world, I don't know why Jesus is continuing to allow that in your life. I wish I did, but I don't know why. But I know it's not because he doesn't love you. Because we can look to the cross and see for all eternity Christ's love for us. So if he's allowing suffering in your life, it's not because he doesn't love you. The cross forever proclaims his love for you. Father in heaven, this is a hard thing to grapple with. And we thank you that you give us grace. I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to reconcile your goodness with the badness of the world. And Lord, give us the grace to doubt well. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.